This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 254, recorded on October 11th, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today right here in the TWIV studio is Dixon Despalmiers. Hello, Vincent. Did you like my 3 a.m. New York City disc jockey? Absolutely. Low tones, almost monotone, gentle, nurturing, um, Allows everyone to buy in, first of all, so you're not yelling. You're just, uh, you know, there's no you know, strenuous ads. About, some uh, DJs or some... They're crazy. They yell like yeah, Howard yeah, Stern, right? right? Um, that's the shock jock. My my all-time favorite was Crazy Eddie ads. <laughs> you have a new mic. Everyone <clears throat> should know Dixon has a brand new microphone. A brand new mic. Which is we bought for him because he needs to fill out. A little more. <laughs> they told me I was too thin. Yeah, it was sounding thin. <clears throat> That's the first time I've heard that in 40 years. Really cloudy today. Dixon. It's very cloudy. In fact, the, the sky is completely full of clouds. There's no <laughs> blue. Is. I was out there earlier, and it was actually spritzing. It's 19 degrees. Yes. And um, With a high humidity, I'm sure. 74%. That's not bad. Well, now... <coughs> Bless you, Dixon. Thank you very much. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hello, Kathy. Good afternoon. Not a cloud in our sky. Oh, my gosh. No kidding. That's Completely too- blue. Wow. Uh, between 68 and 71 degrees, depending on which weather app you follow, <laughs> and uh, 47 or 49 percent humidity. Wow. Is, um, is this a football weekend? I believe the game is away. Hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Otherwise, they'd be I'm, they'd be pouring in already, right? Right. Yeah, I'm going out of town, and so yes, it's away at Penn State. Do you have any study section? No, <laughs> we found that out uh, Wednesday. It's canceled. Yeah, so we found out way far in advance because we were supposed to post our reviews tomorrow night. Hmm. So, and it's because it's not scheduled to next Thursday, Friday. Yeah. Oh, wow, Crazy another stuff. cancellation. Crazy stuff. Hmm. Yeah. Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. You made it back from New York City. I made it back from New York City, <laughs> yes. Fantastic. And now, now I'm back in Western Mass, which has pretty much the same weather as New York. It's 70 degrees, um, cloudy, really high overcast, um, yeah. but not bad. How is the conference? It was good. It was fascinating. It was uh, mm. the microbiome in health and disease oh, was wow. the uh, Neat. the topic. Uh, unfortunately, the first speaker it started a little uh, uh, a little late because the first speaker um, is from the NIH. Mm. <laughs> Oops! Surprised um, that who was going to present uh, probably a really cool talk on the the human microbiome project, and uh, she was forbidden from coming and wasn't even allowed to attend the webcast. Hmm. You know, That's just out of personal so interest. Yeah, they're going to change their name to the Nihilated Institute of. Now let's see. Her name yeah. is was Leia or Layla something. Uh, Le- Lita, I think. Lita, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, she was at ASM a couple of years ago. All right, that's our crew for today. Rich Condit is making his way to Austin, Texas, which is where Twiv will be next week. And I will be heading out there on Tuesday. And WIV will be Wednesday, the 16th of October, at 4 p.m. Austin time. <laughs> and uh, it, you're welcome, the public, uh, the listeners, you're welcome to come. It's in the MBB building, room 1.210. And if you're not familiar with the campus, that building is near the corner of Speedway and Dean Keaton. Hmm. So come. have some Tex-Mex food when you go down there, Vince? So Tuesday we're going to a Mexican oh, good. place. And then um, Wednesday somewhere, there's a, there is a part of town uh, which we're going to eat in. Austin's a great place. And uh, I'm told that then we're going to go hear local music. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. That would be nice. So what he said was, let's see if I can find this. 
<laughs> Here we go. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. We're going to go to uh, uh, South Congress. It's a part of town called South Congress. We're going to go to the Continental Club, and we're going to hear a local rock legend named John D. Graham. All right. All right. Cool. So if you can't make TWIV, come to the Continental <laughs> Club on Wednesday night, and we'll have a tweet up. <laughs> That'll be fun. All right. So we have two local virologists. I'm not going to tell you who they are, but uh, it will be fun. Neat. All right. Today we have a single paper, which will take us a while because it is data rich. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. And we have a bunch of emails still, which we may get to a few of. But the paper was published in Nature not too long ago, the beginning of this month. It's called Immune Clearance of Highly Pathogenic SIV Infection. SIV, of course, Simian Immunodeficiency Virus. This has been recommended by a number of listeners. We read their emails last week. First author is Scott Hansen, and the second author, who also has an asterisk, I presume they contributed equally, yes, mm-hmm. is Michael says, yeah. Piatak, and the senior author is Louis J. Picker. And in between those, there is a long list of et al. A lot of wow. other authors. This is a big, a lot of work. Big project. Involves infection of rhesus macaques, macaca mulata, and these are pretty good-sized primates, right, Dixon? Yep. They require a lot of care. Yep. I think they used 99 for this study. Wow. I remember reading in the methods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is a model for AIDS. They infect these uh, animals with SIV, and uh, they're testing a vaccine here. Mm. A very interesting approach uh, to vaccination. We've talked about other uh, vaccine trials in humans with HIV vaccines, and this one takes a slightly different approach. This one uses a cytomegalovirus vector, CMV, and they use rhesus CMV. So I suppose there are flavors of CMV that infect various species aside from humans. And so you have this one, and this one is nice because you infect the animal, you get a lifelong uh, infection. If the host is immune competent, they don't get sick. It's largely benign infection. And the infection causes a highly TEM-biased CD4 and CD8 T-cell response. Hmm. So what are TEMs? Uh, tell me, Kath. <laughs> <laughs> well, it stands for effector memory T cells. And these are the T cells that can actually do something. They display immediate effector function. And that's contrasted with central memory T cells that can home to areas in lymphoid organs, but they themselves generally don't have much effector function, but they can proliferate and differentiate to become effector cells. So I'm kind of thinking of them as sort of like the stem cells of mm-hmm. memory cells. So an effector function would be like a CD8, a cytotoxic T CD8 cell, right? Mm-hmm. Or, Being able to kill the cell, yeah. right. the target cell. Yeah. And so this effector always bothers me, but I guess it's a good <laughs> way to quickly say, because there are other kinds of effectors. There are CD4s that make cytokines, right, mm-hmm. and provide help to other T cells. So that's the idea here. Why would you want to do a TEM biased vaccine? So again, in monkeys, this rhesus CMV induces these TEM cells, and these monkeys uh, don't get sick, but they do have CMV in them always. It's always present. It's a persistent infection. So the, apparently, the TEM cells protect them from getting sick, but they don't eliminate the infection. So they have published before on on these vectors, uh, essentially what they do is they take the, cytom- the rhesus cytomegalovirus genome, which is a long, quite a long double-stranded DNA, and they insert SIV genes into it, encoding various viral proteins. And they have previously shown that when you do that, you get very nice production of proteins in infected cells. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it doesn't hurt the virus. It doesn't make them 
debilitated in any way, and they've actually done some immunizations in monkeys before. But this paper is kind of the really the ultimate uh, experiment. Now, these um, why would you? Oh, they make an interesting um, summary in one of their other papers uh, that. Um, so this is a T cell vaccine essentially, and this has been done before for HIV. And what they say is that all the previous T cell vaccines that have been designed, they only make antigen for a short period of time, and they tend to give you these central memory T cells that that Kathy uh, described, not effector uh, cells. Hmm. Um, so this they thought would be better. And also these kinds of um, TEM cells are, are mainly the kinds of T cells you find in mucosal sites, which is where HIV transmission, of course, occurs. So they had this idea that maybe a TEM-biased vaccine would be better. So that's what they've been working on for a long time. You okay with this, uh, Dixon, so far? So far, so good. Absolutely. You know what a T cell is, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course I right. do. Like, come on, they, they even have them against parasites, you know. I was, you know, I was just, just going to ask you that. Do they know anything? They I'm know sure they do. About, of course they do. We no, haven't talked on. about it on Twip, though. That's not fair to refer to us as 19th century uh, scientists. That's really, <laughs> you we're kicking and screaming into the 20th century here now. Come on. Uh, All right, I, so it's the 21st. Rhesus <laughs> CMV containing right. a variety of um, SIV proteins. I think they have a a couple of different ones. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I had the impression that this these particular vectors had the whole series, um, GAG, REV, TAT, NEF, and... and oh, yeah, the whole thing. But not VIF. Not VIF. But not VIF, importantly. Yes. Right. All right, so first experiment here in this paper, they take five animals and they immunize them, I think it's subcutaneously, with yes. these vectors. These are These are infectious virus vectors that have to be produced in cells and so forth. Uh, and then um, they are challenged. I think they do two immunizations 14 days apart. And then they challenge them intrarectally with SIV. All right, and the first experiment is a short-term one. They sacrifice them 24 days later. Okay, And they look for, uh, they look for viral RNA in the plasma... They look, of course, at the CD8, the lymphocyte responses. Um, and um, what they find is that um, you get a little bit, in these five animals, you get a little bit of virus in the plasma early on, and then it gets very low. So again, this is a, these are immunized animals mm -hmm. who you're challenging. And they find virus in the blood early on, but then it goes down. And they know these animals were infected because they make a T-cell response against VIF. Aha, which is the one they didn't use. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, they wouldn't have known that. That would be right. tough, right? right? Cool. Right. So Very it's cool. Very now, clever. This, is, this Elegant. particular strain, I gather, this is a particularly <coughs> virulent strain of SIV that they're giving them. So you would expect to see pretty robust replication, right? Yes. So they actually give you some baseline. They say this is pretty low replication because they have a couple of control animals. Um, the level, well, uh, so the um, levels are low compared to unprotected animals, for example. Right. Um, so they have a, a control of, of monkeys that were not immunized or given vector. And sure. the, they make much more virus. And right. that you can find in the supplemental information, which is yes. quite huge yes. <laughs> for this paper. <laughs> With 99 animals, I can imagine why. Yeah, they did a lot of things in addition to measuring the viral load and so forth. Sure. They looked at CD8 responses and CD4 and all sorts of different things. Um, two of these five animals, uh, they also look for viral DNA. So they look for viral RNA, which is an indicator of virus particles, and then DNA, which would be an indicator of proviral DNA integrated into mm -hmm. the genome. So they look for both. And the two of the five animals had low levels of viral DNA and RNA, but they say these are almost at background signals. Um, and they also have a couple of control animals. One... They don't vaccinate, but they treat with antiretroviral. And another turns out to be an elite controller, which this kind of animal just controls the infection naturally. Oh. 
And they say that the amounts of viral RNA and DNA they find is lower than in those kinds of animals, so it's pretty low. So basically you have controlled disinfection. You've, you have a little burst of virus replication early on, in about seven days or so, and then it goes way down. Um, they were able to get virus... So you put the virus in the intestine, right? And so the question is, where else does it go? Well, it clearly goes to the plasma, but it also goes elsewhere. They look in lymph nodes, various parts of the body, uh, the iliosacral lymph nodes, the spleen, bone marrow even, you'll see. And they do find um, virus at these sites. So the virus that they inoculate is getting out of the colon. It's going to other sites uh, and replicating, but it's contained by the immunization. It's very cool. Okay, so far? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Indeed. Now, they have this wonderful table, <clears throat> table one. Amazing amount of information in this table, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. where they look at these animals from several different experiments, and they look for virus in the plasma, that is, copies of viral RNA. And in a animal that hasn't been immunized you would have 110,000 copies of viral RNA per milliliter of plasma, okay? So that's an animal without immunization. And if you gave an animal like that antiretrovirals, they would have 11 (laughs) viral RNA copies per milliliter. And an elite controller has about 500. Mm. These animals, these five animals who were immunized for this first experiment, they have less than five. Uh, mm-hmm. Sorry, yes, less than five yeah. <laughs> copies of viral RNA. It's amazing. And then they also go on and take some lymphocytes from these animals and co- culture them with um, susceptible cells to see if they could grow the virus out. And uh, so the control animals, just to give you an example, this progressor the, with, the, with 110,000 copies per milliliter mm. of viral RNA... 240 out of 240 cultures are positive for virus. Wow. 240 cultures, my gosh, from one animal. That's so <laughs> yep. Now you compare these immunized animals, 6 out of 280, 4 out of 280. So they did a total of 1,360 cult cultures, mm. and 28 of those were positive. Goodness. Just from those five animals. and then Right. Yeah. They do have a longer-term experiment, which we will get to later, but it's in this table where they looked for 70 to 170 weeks and there are zero culturable viruses from these animals. Zero out of 1,549. Goodness gracious. They're less than one copy of RNA per mil. So which doesn't mean there's zero, but because you can't say... They're below the detection limit. Exactly. It's below the detection limit. But it's, it's amazing. Yeah, so they actually they, they get better over time. Yeah, so you have these little bursts initially, and then it's, it's controlled. And the idea, again, is that you know these are persistently replicating vectors. There's always induction of these right. T, right. what are they, EM cells? Mm-hmm. Vector right. memory cells. So maybe that's part of it. Mm-hmm. Maybe. It's just, it's stunning. Mm-hmm. Once you get past all the data, you actually can see how stunning this is. They also do an experiment with intravaginal challenge. Okay, so the one we just talked about was intrarectal. Basically the same idea. They immunize female monkeys with um, these same vectors, and then they challenge them, and they measure all the same things. One of the things they mention here, which they didn't, and I was curious before, they said there's no envelope antibody responses by this kind of immunization Hmm. and you know the envelope is part of the vector Mm -hmm. right but they don't make antibodies against it interestingly so somehow the way it's presented right because you would think that after so many weeks you would get antibodies but Hmm. it's a a t-cell specific uh, vaccine it's quite interesting so nine out of 16 immunized um Female rhesus have um, pretty good control of the virus in the blood, just like right. And it's interesting. One of the things, I mean, this this comes up in in all these experiments. They always get about half of them protected. Mm-hmm. It seems, and it seems like there's not really a spectrum. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, like you the, don't see some that got a little bit of protection. They either they're yeah, either very or protected or not. But those who aren't initially, they eventually clear it as well. There's no, with few exceptions, they all clear the infection or get very low virus loads. Right? Do they? Wait a second. There's one, I think, in the later. Um, um, yeah, this is the the intravaginal challenge. There's one monkey that rebounds late. Right, but that's t- out of the set that has an initial that's protected. Yeah, right. They're following the protected monkeys. Yeah. Um, the ones that aren't protected aren't protected. Well, but but eventually they do. So if you look at Figure Two A, right. Right. Um, the the ones who weren't immunized, those are all the blue lines. They make a lot of virus, ten to the up to ten to the eighth uh, copies of RNA per mil. But below that, all the colored lines, those are all the immunized animals. And you see that the well, no, that's not my reading of two A at all. Um, <laughs> wait, plasma viral load group A is vaccinated. Yeah, group A is vaccinated. Group C is unvaccinated. Yeah, C is the control. So on, on Group A, you see all those colored lines are the monkeys right. that got the vaccine. And um, most of those are controlled. There are, there's some spikes initially, but they all go down to baseline. And then one red one pops up later. But I think Alan is right that in Group A, the vaccinated group, yeah, only a- 9 out of 16... Are protected end up being at all. controllers, and all those blue lines in A are the seven out of nine that were the non-controllers. Right, there are two panels in Figure yeah, Two. Yeah, yeah, right. Those a. those blue ones are the Group A. Group A. These blue ones are non-controllers. Correct. Correct. Which get a spike and then bonkety bonkety bonk, and it stays up ten to the fifth, ten to the sixth plasma viral loads. So they're infected, infected. Right, and they don't follow those anymore. So and we they, don't know what happens. They to eventually. Them now. Terminate that, um, but the, in the first experiment, we didn't we didn't see that. Maybe, right, maybe, it was five out of five, and yeah. this is now nine out of sixteen. So right, so nine out of sixteen are protected. Those sixteen are the, the rest, the ones that aren't protected. You're right; those are the non-controllers there. But of the ones that were controlled, there's some spikes initially early on. You know, there's a right, green, right? And a yeah, red. but what what I found interesting was you don't have you know you don't have any that are sort of kind of controlled. They're either not or they. Or they've got you know a few spikes and then very controlled. Yeah, I don't know if that has to do with the the route of inoculation or not because the right. results with the intrarectal challenge are pretty. Well, it, it's everybody's protected, really, right? Mm-hmm. Is that correct, or am I wrong on that too? Let's see, figure three is the virological. Yeah, I mean, figure three. I guess these are all the protected animals. They're these are all the at. protected animals. These, are, these are from uh, infrarectal and long term. There's basically no virus left. There's no. Uh, uh, there's no viral RNA, right, or DNA detected, and the. Um, right, but my my reading of the yeah. initial vaccinations is that they seem to get consistently fifty percent of the group that they vaccinate gets mm. protected. Mm. Well, at least with the vaginal. Yeah. With that figure one, that was five out yeah, of five. five that one. was five out of five. So let's let's see what we move on to with these. All right, so the intravaginal is nine out of 16. I think they made a comment about that. Nine out of 16 manifested stringent control. Okay. Five of these nine protected had a second episode of transient viremia, but then that was controlled as well. They call those blips. Blips, yes. Um, yeah, they don't talk that much five, more about those ones. Actually, that no. That figure that um, the intrarectal one. Yeah. They they're studying this group of five vaccinated uh, who were taken a necropsy within 24 days of controlling plasma viremia. So I think again they're only looking at the group that the vaccine succeeded in. Well, they say they have a group of five. Who are vaccinated, right? And who, uh, right, five, but the it, the way I'm parsing the sentence is five who... Um, I see. With it taken to necropsy, control controlled the controlled virus. Right. Got it. Right. That right. could be. So I don't, how many mm-hmm. uh, were in that experiment, right? Right. That's the question, which I, is not in the... It is not previous, in the main their previous part of the paper. Work, yeah. They also saw 50%. So I think that's that seems to be the number that comes up. 
Okay. Pretty consistently. So that's, yeah, we recently reported that 50% of macaques yeah. uh, manifest durable aviremic control of infection. Yeah. So that's interesting. And I don't think they ever really get into that, right? Yeah, I mean, it could just be it could just be a dosage thing. Maybe if they give them three shots over a period of time, you'd get closer to a hundred percent, or you know, yeah, maybe yeah. just just the nature of this, the virus either takes or it doesn't. I was wondering if uh, they just need to boost the protein expression, right? I mean, I know it, looking at a previous paper, it seemed pretty good, but I mean, this is all unknown stuff right you have no idea yeah. how much you need maybe an, ad, an additional uh, boost would do it yeah yeah and you're using since it's a live vector that needs to keep replicating i think you probably need to get an established rhesus cmv infection and i don't i don't know maybe that's the limiting factor maybe it's not getting well established in the ones that fail yeah they probably have 10 people working on that right now. Oh, I'm sure. Yes, they're... <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. Or Half more. Half the list is probably <laughs> asking that same question. So I have a basic question to yeah. pose here, and that is, do macaques and humans share a common immunological network? Okay. So that what we're seeing here, we can translate uh, almost knows. directly into people. Well, so I think that's the question, and the only answer is to do a clinical trial, right? Well... I'm yes. sure they will go, <laughs> after having enough monkey data, they will go into a clinical trial, right? Right. Because, you know, obviously monkeys have T cells, and we do too, but who knows if this will translate. Well, right? the TEM right. and the C, yeah, the TCM, I just wondered about those two categories that you just, you, uh, you just ran across that term today, as far as I know, Vince. Yeah, that doesn't mean anything. It's well, <laughs> I ran across it yesterday in our departmental seminar, and okay, then I thought, oh, it doesn't matter. And then I ran across it in the states that okay, twice. But it's I've not being used in down. terms of human um, immunological data, though, is it? I mean, oh, yeah, I think they... we have TEMs and TCMs also. Sure. But yes, they don't express yes, it this way. Yesterday's I mean, seminar. that's easy. To, you, you do facts with markers, and you can pick up the population. So. Right, 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 right. But uh, okay. But your your question is valid. And the only way is to I mean, I know these, that's true for all animals. I mean, animals, you can't use rhesus CMV, no. I would guess. You have to use human CMV, right? If right, you and you'd it. be protecting, hopefully, against HIV, not SIV. Of course. Uh, exactly. Of course. I mean, there are lots of so, ifs. Yeah. Who knows? So which antigens you would you pick for humans? I would do the same, except this, right? Yeah. Yeah, just leave this out so that you can measure. Yeah, sure, sure. And the problem is you can't challenge people. Right. You have right. to do a study exactly. where you immunize an at-risk like population, population and then wait a year and see how many get AIDS sure. and how many don't, right? Sure. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you'll end up immunizing 10,000 people and maybe get 100, if you're lucky, who develop AIDS. It's very huge tough. Study. Huge study. But I don't know. These, I mean, except for the 50%, this is quite promising because in the animals that are protected, the virus goes away. Right. You yeah. Know, we always have this... Uh, Issue that oh, if you let the virus integrate, uh, it's you're hanging you're, around. You're, you're stuck. Yeah, that's right. But in these animals, it's integrating because they pick it up in in cells, right. and even at that point, it can get away. It can be cleared later on. Yeah, and the, the subsequent data that we're going to get to, it goes even further with how much it's cleared. Mm -hmm. So then they ask, can you? So we've protected so far against intrarectal, intravaginal. Can you protect against? Intravenous inoculation. Needle sticks. Right? Needle sticks. Oh, yeah. Drug use. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they do the same thing. They take animals who are immunized with these vectors, and they challenge them intravenously. Right. Pretty much uh, the same. Let's see. They challenged six vaccinated um, monkeys with intravenous virus and found that two of the six had the same pattern of control. So a little less than 50% there. But the sample size is only six. Yeah, but also it's a different route of immunization. A different know. route could yeah. be could be part of it. So they they claim that uh, you know you can control even intravenous infection um, with this immunization. And the other four got no protection. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, then they do a long term experiment. They followed ten protected monkeys for sixty nine to one hundred and eighty weeks. And that was what I had referred to uh, earlier in the table. They just, I mean, the virus drops to undetectable, both by PCR and by co-culture. Um, and if you look at the graph, you, you see uh, viral load, there are blips early on in some of these monkeys. And then it drops to undetectable by 
90 to 100 weeks. After that, there's nothing. Right. There's no DNA. There's no viral RNA, just little blips here and there. So at what point do you declare a victory then? I mean, what is your percentage protection that you would say, aha, we finally have a vaccine? Well, people, I think it needs to be 90%. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true, too. <laughs> but, I mean, some people, when they get to the 50% mark, say, at least you can cut it down by 50% this way. And Well, if you, well you can't necessarily. Though. I know, I know. Yeah. If you had a 50% protective vaccine in people, an HIV vaccine, it would probably be licensed, I would guess. Right. That's better than nothing. In the malaria field, that's not enough. You know, the first polio vaccine was 54% effective. Huh. It was licensed immediately. In Ann Arbor, Michigan, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> What's the name of that hall again? Uh, Rackham. Rackham Hall. Rackham. It was where the, where the announcement was. Yeah. I, went to, yeah. I walked by it one morning when I was out there, took wow. pictures of it. Great virus history. So um, there is no detectable uh, virus in these animals. And remember, early on, they can detect it in some of them, and they find it in lymph nodes, and mm -hmm. they, they find VIF, CD8 cells, so they know that these animals have been challenged. But um, so what was the number there? Ten protected animals. So again, we don't know out of what, right? I'm going to guess about 20 vaccinated. Yeah, I bet we could find it in the <laughs> supplementary data. It's probably, yeah, it's probably in there. So that's one uh, objection I have to this paper. There's so much data that if you just want to read the paper and get the whole story, it's very tough without looking at the, preliminary, uh, the supplementary data, right? Mm -hmm. It's very yeah. hard. And I find it difficult. I, I read all my papers on the screen, and I find it really hard to go back and forth. Yeah. You need a bigger computer. Yeah. So, <laughs> one of their, uh, let's see, it's their, uh, yeah, their 2013 science paper mm -hmm. is this, no, that's not the one, 2011 science paper? No, it's the, yeah, it's the 2013 science paper is in this new format where there's just one page mm. in the journal, oh, yeah, and that. then everything is all integrated into this yeah. really long thing that you can read online. So... Maybe We've all been reduced to, to executives. Well, you know, I, I, I would really like to have all the data in, <laughs> in a nice does. narrative. I know, right? I know, I know, I yeah. know. Yeah. I wanted to point out that uh, when they're assaying these uh, long-term animals mm -hmm. for virus, not only do they just measure virus loads um, by DNA or RNA, but they do this really nice, what I consider the gold standard sensitive bioassay, where they... Uh, take the samples, and then they uh, put them back into animals. Yes. So you're talking about the adoptive transfer experiment? Right. Yeah, uh, yeah it's figure 3E is where right. I made the note of it, yeah. Yeah, so they have lymphoid cells from infected animals, right, who are not vaccinated. Um, they have or, or are vaccinated. So they yeah. have a with or without, or, and then they have two with uh, ret antiretrovirals, right? And they put those into animals who are vaccinated, right? Right. So the question is, these ones where you can't detect the virus at all, can they transmit it? Right. And the answer is no. Yeah, they don't transmit it. They put in uh, uh, ten to the, six times 10 to the seventh uh, lymphoid cells, hmm. which is a mixture of blood leukocytes and lymph node cells and even some bone marrow and spleen cells thrown in there. Yeah, and they don't transfer the infection. And and it's into SIV naive rhesus right. macaques. Right. So. Whereas if you if you yeah. do this transfer coming from um, elite controller or or a retroviral therapy treated monkeys, they do transmit the infection. So these are SIV naive, but they've been immunized, right? The recipients are not. No, they're, recipients they're are naive. not immunized. So the donors are immunized. Donors right. are immunized, and they've gotten to this point where they're not having spikes anymore. Yeah, right, right. So and so they're, the, yeah. the question is, where, when we're looking at this undetectable levels, Got it. Yep. is there some virus there that could nonetheless be, tra be transmitted? So they take lymphoid cells out, and they put them into a completely naive monkey. Yeah. Um, and, and that monkey doesn't get infected. Yeah, so that's your gold standard, Kathy, right? That's, yeah. yeah. And so that would imply that in the population, if you could do this in people, you would interrupt transmission, right? Exactly. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. So that's basically it, right? Mm -hmm. Which is 
I don't mean that, that, I don't enough. mean it. That's enough. But uh, that'll do. Right. What's they, for dinner? What's for dinner? So they, what they conclude is an effective memory T cell vaccine could, by itself or together with antibody targeted approaches, provide meaningful long term efficacy. So it'll be interesting to know if they're going to do um, rhesus experiments with also an antibody generating vaccine together with this. Maybe you get past that fifty percent, right? Mm. No. You can imagine that with antiretrovirals and this, you might have uh, quite an effective block of infection. Yeah. So, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. I don't think we mentioned where these researchers are from. Nope. Most of them are from the Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute and Oregon National Primate Research Center at the Oregon Health, Sci- Health and Science University. And then there's some from Frederick, Maryland as well. And, oh, some statistical help from the Fred Hutchinson Center in Seattle. 99 rhesus macaques were used. On the wall. (laughs) Were used for these experiments. That's the title of the show, I hope. Yeah. 99 macaques on the wall? Yeah. Mm. (laughs) Dixon, you must have ridden on too many buses. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a lot of free time to think about these things. Without... Well, so that's quite a nice paper, and many people have asked, and we are impressed. Mm-hmm. It's yep. quite. I think this is <clears throat> one of the best uh, results obtained in the macaque model so far, right? So yep. keep your eye out for more. Yeah, and this, um, it's interesting. You know, it's not, it's not like they used some special antigen that nobody's used before or did anything the, the different uh, in terms of, of what's going into this vaccine. It's the vector. Right. That's different. And, and yeah, it's the, the vector, for sure. And the response you get from this vector is different from the response that you get from most of the others that have been tried. Yeah, someone had an idea. Let's, we should try this vector. It has these. Yeah. Um, the virus in the natural host has these qualities, and maybe that's important. So, And that's sometimes how... Science moves forward. Yeah. The uh, supplemental f- data is 22 figures and three tables. <laughs> and, you know, the answers to all of our questions are probably buried in there. I'm sure. Like how many yeah. animals were used for uh, each experiment yeah. and so forth. And so another basic question, though, is yes. that uh, for those that are not viral um, savvy, uh, CMV virus attacks what cell types again? Mononuclear cells, macrophages. Mm. You mean antigen presenting cells, perhaps? Dendritic? No? Uh, you're pushing the envelope of what I can say off the top of my head. <laughs> I'm curious. Because if the cytomegalovirus identifies the proper cell that presents the proper antigen to the proper T cells, then you're in, like Flynn, as I would say. That's, that's how that's working. I'm looking. Because that that might be the trick to find the vector that gets you to where you're you can't get when you start to inject randomly. This virus doesn't go randomly; it goes right to that particular group of cells. And then, I mean, isn't that the beauty of the system? Am I not re- expressing something that you guys already knew, or is this uh, well, yeah, another way of looking at the system? That, that's kind of uh, it's a more detailed. Um, uh, presentation of what I was kind of getting at with its, okay, it's okay. the vector. It's okay. the, but um, why the is it the vector? That's the point. Right. The vector stimulates this kind of response, and your question is, why does the vector stimulate well, this kind of response? Yeah, because I'd like to know. You know, inquiring minds like to know these things, Alan. Yes. <laughs> yes. So here's what um, human cytomegalovirus infects. Peripheral uh, blood leukocytes, okay. right? Your white blood cells. Yeah, but which ones? That's a huge category. That doesn't probably, say anything. Probably, well, it That's, includes B and T cells. Well, of course it Not does. A, this is a 2013 virology but chapter. I, just when I was out. in 1962, I'm not done. Students. Can you let me finish? <laughs> no, I can't. What's wrong with peripheral blood leukocytes? You get the Buffy coat and there's virus in it. Yeah, right. So, all right, here we go. Um Monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, dendritic cells, ah. and some um, some other non-immune cells. What about bone marrow cells? Yes. Uh, the lately infected myeloid cell population remains in the bone marrow. Precursors of monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells. Isn't that where you want to get rid of the this, HIV virus? 
In the bone marrow? Yeah, because that's where it sticks around, even though it's cleared sure. from the rest. Yeah, that's what uh, mm-hmm. Kathy Collins thinks, right? I, re- I remember mm-hmm. that Talk to show. her about that. I remember yeah, that and show. because CMV is persistent, once you have it, you have it. See, there you, there you go. Um, now, HCMV may infect endothelial cells in addition to myelomonocytic cells, uh, neutrophils, phagocytic cells. Okay, you get the picture, Dixon? Got the picture. I'm reading this from the latest chapter of Fields. I can see Fields, you're doing that. Which is very heavy. So it doesn't yeah. affect like <laughs> I have mine down off the shelf like too. <laughs> brain cells or muscle cells or kidney cells or pancreatic islet cells. It infects the same, the same cells that are going to present antigens to the uh, immune system and get them to work right. And so this is a brilliant viral vector. That's what I would say. Brilliant, not just good. This is brilliant. So why don't we engineer this one with some malaria antigens and see what happens there too because we've got the same problem uh now are people who have cmv um super infectable yes they are okay that's well, that's yeah, I, well ah, right because it's a common infection that's paper right. that, yeah monkeys that certainly are yeah that, yeah that yep right you could be super infected right so. okay because that's that's crucial since what like 80 percent of the population is cmv positive right <laughs> that's right so here I'm reading the blog that you linked to, Kathy, and Picker gave a talk at the AIDS vaccine con- conference, and he said, why half of the monkeys are protected? Yeah. He said, we don't have an answer. He said it may be related to the virus they're using, which is SIV MAC239, which replicates to levels 100 times higher than its human counterpart. And he says the fact that the vaccine works against this means might mean that it could be even better in humans. I don't know if it'll be 50% in humans. It may be 70%. It may not work at all. There's simply no way to know until we test it. He hopes to start trials in 2016. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's a long time. It is. It's when the uh, latest NASA probe reaches Jupiter, by the way, in case you wanted to use a time frame for this. Another thing. question is we don't know if CMV <laughs> vectors are safe in humans. They're designing one. Right. And, of course, you've got to take out genes that would make it pathogenic, right? Right. There are yeah. a lot of immune evasion genes in CMV, so I guess he said yeah. he's taking out a gene needed for replication, so maybe, I don't know, you would want to make it replication defective, right? That's why this thing probably yeah, works. Exactly, exactly. Anyway, some of the and, questions, right? Yep. Yes, go ahead. I, 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 I was the give, one who posted that blog. I was just going to give Alan the credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm not the blog follower. Alan is. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, all, it's our collective, all of our stuff here. Yes. All right, let's do some email. Dixon, do you have it lined up in front of you? I sure do. All right, we're going to do some email. I'm going to let uh, Alan take this first long one. Right. Okay. John writes, Dear Twiv Gang, in Twiv 84, Gators go for... Are we that far behind on email? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, good. But somebody is. <laughs> Gators go viral May 2010. You discussed oncolytic myxoma virus. Grant McFadden and Vince asked uh, the 10248 mark uh, when he thought such viruses would be used in the clinic. Grant was optimistic that oncolytic viruses would find clinical use, but didn't want to get pinned down on estimating timelines, saying, well, you know, the road is littered with people who make <laughs> predictions about where medical research is going and how long it will take to get there. I would say I don't know. I don't know what the long term will be, but I certainly expect to see in my lifetime specific uses of oncolytic viruses for certain cancers. And as clinicians learn how to use them, and scientists get more strategic in showing how best to use them, that their uses will grow at some point in the future. And later, at um, an hour and four minutes, I think there's a real likelihood a number of these viruses are going to find their way for actual treatment of real cancers in humans. And I like to think it is in my lifetime. Since 2010, there's been lots of progress made in oncolytic viral therapy. Notably, uh, first, Amgen has interim statistically significant, P less than 0.001, durable response data from its phase three oncolytic herpes virus trial, uh, and it gives a link, and a statistical trend toward improved survival in a pre-planned interim analysis. Uh, second, Oncolytics Biotech announced positive interim tumor response data from stage one of its phase three trial, of an oncolytic rheovirus, reolysin. The crucial data on overall survival are due out any day now, perhaps before this letter is read on TWIV. Furthermore, Oncolytics Biotech has released a lot of data from the single arm phase two trials, um, for example, in squamous cell lung cancer. And I'm just, I'm not going to be able to find this that quickly on the Oncolytics website, am I? I looked, I didn't see anything. I'm sure, I'm sure it would be. 
I mean, I think it's, I think it's imminent. Yeah. It's not out yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, now back to the letter. Um, let's see. Further, more oncolytics biotech has released a lot of data from signal. All right. For example, in squamous cell lung cancer, gives another link metastatic melanoma, another link pancreatic cancer, two more links in non small cell lung cancer, uh, another link. So, oncolytics, yeah, they're, uh, as you guessed by the company name, they're, they're very involved with this. Uh, third, in a dose escalation trial of only 30 patients, Generex's uh, oncolytic vaccinia virus demonstrated a statistically significant overall survival advantage in the high-dose cohort of its advanced hepatocellular carcinoma patients, uh, although it stumbled in a more recent trial and gives a couple of links. With overall phase 3 data soon to appear from Amgen and Oncolytics, it's an exciting time for oncolytic viral therapy. I was wondering if the time would be ripe to ask Grant if he'd be willing to give some predictions on when we'll see oncolytic viruses used in the clinics. Please ignore this letter if this phase three data are already out and definitive by the time you read it. Sincerely, John. I have. To, I should actually have sent this to to Grant, but um, I have a feeling he won't predict yet. Right. <laughs> but after all these results are out, it would be fun to look at them. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then he gives a listener pick of the week. Are we going to... Um, yeah, you can go ahead and do that. Okay, so P.S. I have a listener pick of the week, a YouTube video produced by a graduate student in string theory whose advisor could well be Weird Al. <laughs> this is pretty funny. Oh, yeah, I remember looking at this. Yeah. 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 Acapella science, bohemian gravity. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, so really it, well done. It's well done. And, and so Weird Al, you know, does those well done video... Yeah. Um, making fun of other videos, so this is up the same alley. All right, Kathy. Josh writes, Dear TWIV doctors, this morning I was searching for info about flu shots, specifically if the new formulations were available, and I found this on my first page of Google results, a screenshot. Please let me know if you cannot see it. As you can see, there is lots of great info, but something that Google calls an in-depth article from quote, Lou Rockwell, that says you shouldn't have the flu shot, just take a bunch of vitamin D. It also lists the article in the same category as articles from Time and the New York Times. Whatever criticisms can be leveled at those two publishers, they would never publish anything so ridiculous, and putting them side by side just elevates the nonsense. Makes me so changry. That's a community TV show reference, evidently. Yeah, well, there's not much you can do about search... uh results right alan no um i mean even google has they, they've got an algorithm for this but um uh it's uh it's imperfect that's part of the problem people search for info and they get crap next to the good stuff and they don't know how to distinguish the two yeah right dixon correct you came back well yeah i thought you were leaving us well I, it was sort of an emergency exit but i'm back <laughs> you need a drink of water? Yeah, exactly. That was what the problem was, of course. All right, the next one is from Aisha, who writes... I can take it. <laughs> you can take the next one. I want you to... You, re, you should just relax for a few minutes. Oh, okay. Aisha writes, Ouch, a strong argument for science funding, and she links to... I have to remember what this is. Oh, yes. Oh, this is so silly. This is some article in The Anachronist (laughs) where he says, basically, you don't know what science is. Science is not data. It's the people doing the data, Mm. right? Science is people. It's a collective human endeavor where people make theories, test them based on observation, then refine the theory. Data is just a side object. So this is someone who doesn't understand what science is. Would Would you agree with me? He phrases it very poorly. That that intro is kind of a, um, it's it's a reach. What he's trying to do is link to a popular trend in order to get his message across. So what he does in the lead for this thing is says no is is point out you know people say they like science and then they they are actually talking about the pretty pictures from NASA and and these sorts of things and um, and his real point is that science is a process. It's not. It's not a pretty picture from NASA, uh, which I think you probably would agree with, right? <laughs> Nor is it a table well, of numbers. But he, I mean, in this in this brief either. intro, which I see, I know here, the brief the, it the intro come across um, as if that. you if you follow it through to the Mashable site, which bought this article because it was popular. Um, it uh, the the argument that he subsequently makes is actually 
pretty straightforward. I mean, he he points out people go around saying that they they that yeah, science is great, rah rah rah, and and really, um, if you look at the numbers on this and you look at what our society funds, um, you can make a fairly stark case that we we spend more money on shooting people and blowing them up by orders of magnitude than we do on um, paying people to do science. So if yeah, this is yeah. a society that loves fine. science, it sure doesn't show up in the numbers, yeah, is the right. essence it's of the fine. argument. That's but fine. a very poor lead. I would the agree. lead is horrible. I yeah. mean, right. I think, I, and I agree that people like pretty pictures, okay? But if that gets them yeah. into science, I don't care. That's fine. But the data as well as the scientists are both part of it. And right. to yes. do this is just, that's what I object to here. Right. Yeah, and data, I think data are when not you, a side object. When you when you follow through, you know he first starts into the average Sally for a postdoc, you know being pretty low, and then he has the horrible trend in the NIH research budget or the NASA budget, and then military spending going the opposite yeah. way. So that's you know so the argument of it's people is means that you have to have people to generate the data. Well, yeah. So duh, yeah. <laughs> And to uh, interpret the data too. <laughs> well, I just think if you're gonna, but that's silly, isn't it? Just the way it begins, it is absurd. Yeah, right. yes. I think Aisha meant it in a positive way, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think. I think this is. I, I think she's pointing to the central argument here, not the um, right. Not so the, the, the problem here is it got bought by Mashable, and I didn't want to go on to Mashable, right? So you couldn't read the whole thing here. So I mean, this guy, you know, he just wants money. For writing. <laughs> hey, so. hey. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's fine. Depends on what you're writing. <laughs> um, actually, I heard a good quote the other day. Someone said, if you write and put it up for free all the time, you are cheapening the, uh, yeah, the that's profession. Because right. yeah, people should pay for what you do. But we're way beyond that. Dixon, here you go. Okay, okay, okay. Jen. Um, right, Jen writes, H again, all. I presume she meant hi. Finally got somewhat caught up. Just wanted to send my apologies for not being more clear with my book comments. Men Against Death is by Paul de Kroof, who also wrote another great one called Microbe Hunters. And for not catching Dixon's pick of Eleven Blue Men by Ruscha. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Jen. Did I do good? You did well. All right. All right. We're back to Alan. Franklin writes, hello, Vincent and crew. In this week's TWIV number 251, you mentioned that you had learned a way to keep MHC 1 and 2 straight. Everything equals 8. Back when I was an undergrad, I used a different memorization trick that connects more <laughs> concepts for me. If there are visual learners in your audience, I think the system might be easier for them to remember. I won't take credit for the idea, but I also don't remember anyone showing it to me. <laughs> <laughs> good, that's I, good. I have a lot of stuff like that. <laughs> I don't think I came up with this, but here it is. All right, uh, have a great day. Keep up the good work. And Frank is at SIU. Um, so for helper T cells, think about the shape of an H. If you overlay other shapes on it, a four fits in it, in the H. Um, so like CD4 CD4 cells. CD4. Yeah. Yeah. Also, a Roman numeral 2 II fits in it, right? So, MHC2. Uh, additionally, the shape of the MHC2 structure matches it. And he has a little doodle that he, that he linked to. Um, <laughs> for cytotoxic T cells, they don't match the H shapes. C, cytotoxic, doesn't fit in the H. Uh, CD8, unless you grew up with just digital clocks, uh, the 8 does not fit in the H. <laughs> MHC1, you... Uh, well, I guess the one would fit in the H, but not the other half of the uh, <laughs> structure of the, and the structure of MHC one uh, doesn't fit as cleanly in the H. Sorry for my artwork. I'm a medical <laughs> student, not an art student. <laughs> I, I thought those were really helpful. Yeah, um, those are good. Yeah, the original one is simpler, <laughs> which well, is you know everything equals eight. CD four <laughs> times two MHC two is eight, et cetera, et cetera. This incorporates more things. It does. It does so. a little more, right? Right, the structures structure of the, the protein. As long as you don't yeah. forget them, that's all you can't it forget them. That's the thing. No. When you get more complicated, it's by association. That's how we learn. We learn by association. Kathy, Peter writes, "Dear Twiv team, first I would like to say how much I am enjoying Professor Racaniello's virology course on Coursera. It is thirty years since I studied any biochemistry, so I'm having to do a lot of extra reading to get up to speed. I'm looking forward to virology too, though." 
I read of an alternative approach to providing broad immunity against influenza, and I would be interested in your views on this. It is not a universal vaccine, but rather sequential vaccination against different influenza strains. And then he gives two links, uh, one to Science Daily and one to uh, Wistar, probably sort of a press release thing. According to Dr. Scott Hensley, since we know now that pre-exposure events can influence vaccine responsiveness in a predictable way, we can begin to design vaccine regimens that preferentially elicit antibody responses against conserved regions of influenza virus. We may be able to strategically vaccinate our children with antigenically diverse influenza strains to elicit antibodies against conserved viral epitopes. And that's the end of Dr. Scott Hensley's quote. Presumably, since we can already produce vaccines against different strains, it should be possible to test this approach in clinical trials fairly quickly. If successful, the strategy could be implemented before the more experimental universal vaccines will be ready for production. So, um, so uh, Vincent found, or uh, points out that uh, Peter Palese uh, also did similar work that's been so, published. So the, the general idea here is that when you... Uh, so you get infected with a strain of flu, then years later you get infected with a related strain. You make a memory <coughs> response preferentially to the globular head of the HA. And what this paper and, and Peter's does is if you challenge someone with a totally unrelated HA globular head, then you make a better response to the conserved stalk. So Peter's approach has been to immunize mm-hmm. with uh, chimeric HAs, where the stalk is from a virus that you want to protect against, and the head is something that you've never seen, that humans have never seen, for for example. And so you don't get a big memory response against the head. Mm-hmm. You get a primary, and then you get a better response against the stalk. Right? Makes sense? Yep. Yeah. Right? So that's what both of these approaches. So I think this is a good strategy, and it's being done by multiple people, as you can see, and will probably go into a, a clinical trial. Yeah. Well, and aren't those of us who get a new flu vaccine every year sort of doing the experiment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're not getting a lot of um, right. conserved antibodies against broadly neutralizing conserved epitopes, right? Yeah. yeah. You're getting a memory, mostly a memory response, unless the strain changes. So if, if, we, if we had a brand new virus, flu virus now coming up next year and we made a vaccine against it, then you might get some uh, conserved uh, antibody responses. You mean like when we when we had H one N one? Yeah, but that was related to R- related. Others, yeah, you know? not, if we not had different a, enough. You know, if we had right. an H nineteen N two, which we've never seen, uh, then you would get some broadly neutralizing antibodies as a consequence. Right. So yeah, so we are doing the experiment. In fact, part of these studies is to look in sera of people with a lot of influenza experience and try and see what they have. Yeah. Well, uh, there was also just a little while ago. Um, I think I blogged this on Turbid Plaque, um, Turbid or maybe Plaque. on my maybe on my <laughs> previous incarnation of my blog on my um, what's now my personal site. Um, but uh, there was a meta-analysis looking at um, flu vaccine efficacy in match versus mismatch years, mm-hmm. um, and the conclusion was essentially that it uh, it doesn't matter much. <laughs> Um, which, which is both heartening and disheartening, um, cause it, it suggests that what we're doing with the flu vaccine isn't really what we think we're doing. So um, the, the efficacy is irrelevant depending it, on whether it's totally a match. It's totally irrelevant, yeah. but it's when you, when they ran the statistics on it, it, it looks like it doesn't make anywhere near as big a difference as you might expect yeah. it to. So what is the rough number? Uh, it's, oh, um, I'm going to make me look this thing up. Because um, this was not just in the elderly population, right? No, this was. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so this is on Turbid Plaque that I blogged it. Um, so it's a. It, they came up with. Um, uh, let's see, fifty-nine percent. Um, Overall, for the injected vaccine, um, okay. So, 
the the inhaled the the live inhaled uh, flu mist is is separate. It's eighty three percent efficacy for, and it's especially uh, effective in kids. Um, but looking at the injected, uh, they, it's sixty five percent in the pool data efficacy when the strains match, um, and uh, when the strain when the vaccine and virus don't match, it's fifty four percent. For the live and 52% for the injected, so the so you go from 65% to 52% with a mismatch. So are you saying we shouldn't bother uh, predicting? We should. Just- um, I, I I don't know. <laughs> I I mean, this was a meta analysis. It's got all the problems yeah, of meta analyses, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and why oh, the reason I blogged it was this is a really crunchy problem that that yeah, quite. you know it's uh, very very difficult to get at what the real number is. Um, I think if you have a choice, you should take the uh, nasal spray. Oh, yeah. But if you don't, you, the injected will still give you at least a milder disease, if not, you know, full protection. Right. And that's part of the right, problem Dixon? is how, how do you define efficacy? Right, Vincent. <laughs> Dixon, you and I going to go get ours next week? We are. You're going to drag me over? I almost dragged you, you today. You don't have to drag me over. Almost did it today. I was reading this. Wow. I was reading we this are paper. Late. Right. I, I told right. Dixon I have to read this paper. And as you see, it was difficult as it was. I should, I should have spent even more time on it. Right. Uh, the next one is from Eric Delwart, our friend over in San Francisco. He writes, I realize there is much news to pick from, but I think the recent progress in the HIV vaccine from front, where inoculation with a CMV vector expressing HIV proteins rises above the noise. The fact that it led to virus eradication, which he has in capital letters, after viremia was detected in the inoculated animals is remarkable and quite a step forward from previous vaccination strategies. It may be the chronic nature of CMV is what resulted in such effective immune responses and that chronic rather than transient vectors may be the way forward for viruses such as HIV and HCV. Of course, it is not expressing HIV proteins. No. It's SIV. That's that's what I was... Actually, I, I caught that one. Dixon, you are just awesome. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, yeah, so right. it's a good paper. We should do it sometime. <laughs> it's, that's oh, not a bad wait. idea. <laughs> yes. Just after we recover Alzheimer's disease causes. Dixon, you got the next one. I have the next one. Okay, fine. James writes, Kia ora, folks. Anyone want to clearly interpret that one for again, me? Again, 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 again. It's again? from New Zealand. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. But <laughs> Kathy <laughs> does it every time, and you forget. You're right, I do. In TWIV uh, two four six, you talk about the agreement that has come up to with the Lax family and publishing uh, the genomes of the HeLa cells. Firstly, and quickly, Rich mentions that. The, the German group, then how we, in quotes, in an age of uh, HIPAA, no, the U.S. has HIPAA. Other countries have different systems that can vary a lot, coupled with universal public funded health care and the thought processes around the handling of genome data can be very different to what you think. My goodness, I'm having trouble reading can you, all that. Do you need glasses? No, I have glasses. I probably should take them off. <clears throat> now, on to the more thorny issue of the family. Yes, the HeLa cells contain the same basic genome that is present in parts of the children and grandchildren. However, how similar are they? The cells were used deceased and have spent decades mutating and been mutating in different ways, whilst the descendants have ever-shrinking parts of this genome and have much more stable parts. All the way back around TWIV 105, you mentioned the personal genome project that would will put that will put in the public domain the genomes of people, not the genome of some cancerous cell, but the genome of healthy tissue. How can this person consent in the place of their descendants to have parts of their genome publicly available with detailed history of the person it came from? When do we say that a descendant has no further say in the release of data? For example, the great-great-grandchildren of Henrietta Lacks will only have one thirty-second of her genome. I do think the HeLa agreement is a useful stepping stone, but it is far from the end game as more and more of these genomes are released or leak out. As Alan said, it's a flimsy barrier where there are so many ways around it, even without access to the cell line to sequence yourself. And I seriously doubt that the final step 
up will look anything like what was agreed upon with the Gila genome. Please don't avoid these thorny topics, as the discussion is important. Regards, James. Well, Kia Ora to you, too. Dixon, you read stories to me perfectly. I know. This is this was a difficult um, set of phrases. I don't know. Did anybody have uh, trouble just no. glancing through this? I enough? think I should print them out for you. Maybe I should have stayed out of the room when I left. No, no, no. <laughs> We're just it's giving, We're Sorry, just I, giving you I hell. I stumbled. Yes, Kathy. Um, it might be because I have just now finished <laughs> reading The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which mm. I downloaded onto my iPad almost two years ago, and I almost <laughs> never read off of the electronic iPad. So, it's, yeah. But, I, you know, toward the end are sort of the most um, emotionally charged chapters with the Lax family. And, and so mm-hmm. I, I'm still kind of seeing it from that viewpoint. Um, but I did contact one of my genetics colleagues here um, because I, I feel like I'm the one that's uh, spitting into the wind with this argument that, um, yes, the HeLa genome has a lot of mutations in it relative to, you know, what was in her normal tissue and what was in her relatives. But he agrees with me that the reshuffling of the sequence and the in vitro mutations simply add to the informational noise that are in many regions of the genome. And, and the genomic signal uh, in a lot of places can still be pulled out. So it's probably not ever such that the level of mutation is so high that you couldn't find some things that are relevant in the descendants. And yes, there is the, uh, you know, dilution factor, you know, one to uh, one thirty second of her genome is what was quoted by the um, author. Um, but even relatives who are not um, direct lineal descendants um, will still have some DNA that's related, and and it may even be more related than the direct lineal descendant. So, it's just something to keep thinking about. That it, you know, if you're giving permission for your genome sequence to be published, or we now have Henrietta Lacks's genome, at least as it was in these tumor cells at the time they were, the DNA was isolated for sequencing. Um, it, it may still have implications for the relatives. Yes. Of course, at this point, we don't know what those implications are, but presumably in the f- some future, you'll be able to look at it and say, ah, you have this and this and this, and some people might not like that, right? Right. That's, that's the idea. Well, I think whether we get to that future or not, the uh, I think the fact that we don't know where this is headed suggests that we ought to be a little careful. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's fine for this Gila agreement because the family wanted this, but yeah. I think you need to put sequence data out there. That's how we learn about it. So do we have Francis Collins and James Watson sequence? Because that's the two that they sequenced to get the human genome to begin with. Yeah, they're out there, I believe, right? All right. They didn't object to that, right? It no. wasn't Francis Collins, was it? No, it, it was, was uh, um, Craig Venter. I thought it was. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Yeah. It was Craig, Craig Venter. Venter. It was Craig Venter. Dixon, but, would you release your genome sequence? Sure. Why not? Yeah, I would too. I have a reading deficit. <laughs> 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 what does that mean? <laughs> it means I can't read properly sometimes. I don't know why, but that's... You'll it's find that so, in so the G's in his sequence are going to show up as C's. Anyway. <laughs> That's right, exactly right. <laughs> exactly. Um, I just think you know you don't have to release your sequence, but we have to have enough looked at globally to make you know conclusions about disease and mutations sure. and so forth. Of course. And if everyone's going to hide their genome, you can't do that. So oh, right. you know, I don't know what N is for that, but it's got to be a good number. So, I mean, this one you could study if you apply for permission and so forth, and that's fine. But, uh, you know, others, well, if you go to the Personal Genome Project, uh, you sign a release to release your data because that's what they want to do there. I don't have a problem with that, but hopefully right. enough people won't so that we can right. do the analysis. Sure. Uh, Alan, we are back to you. Okay. Richard writes, hello, Vincent et al., I really enjoyed hearing about the inner workers of the prin- inner, inner workings of the <laughs> principles of virology Illuminati. Uh, I wondered if it might be possible to share your list of often misused words and phrases in virology and mole- molecular biology, as this is a topic with which many researchers struggle. I think the importance of precise and succinct language becomes especially important for bi- biologists interested in education, where so often we use phrases 
uh, to cliche without actually understanding the detailed and sometimes incorrect meaning of our jargon. For example, that cliche is not a verb. There's yes. a substantial body of discussion. <laughs> sorry, sorry. There's a substantial body of discussion of some of these misused phrases. Homology and epigenetic come to mind, and it seems like your list of more commonly misused terms might be of use to many of us. Keep up the great work, Rick. So yesterday we have a, twice a month we meet in Princeton to work on the book, and we had a meeting yesterday. And I'm writing down all these words. Okay, <laughs> yesterday we had a couple, and I would read, and Jane would go, "No." No, that word's no good. And so I, wrote, I would write it down. <laughs> and I would often ask her why, and she would explain why, and I wrote down the... So maybe after the, the year of working on this is up, I'll have a list of stuff. You know what? You, you need to work up a routine, the seven words you can't say in variety. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, Kathy. Marin writes, Dear Twivers, my name is Marin, and I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Virology at the Free University of Berlin. During my studies of biology, I majored in virology, and I'm currently working on influenza hemagglutinin. After a long battle with myself, I decided to finally take action and participate in your podcast. Good. As a listener pick of the week, I would like to introduce you to my childhood heroes, Maestro, Pierret, and Sai, huh. all being characters of the fantastic cartoon Once Upon a Time, Life. It is a cartoon series from the 90s, which was aired all over Europe, but I'm not aware of it being aired in the U.S. It is a French series that tells about the body, the cells, the immune system, oh basically my. everything you need to know to start a fascination with biology. It's a very cute story for kids with all the heroes you will fall in love with who defend the body against nasty diseases played by the story villains. As a kid, I just loved the stories and the characters, but watching it now again with my godchild made me realize mm. how scientifically accurate the whole thing was. Mm. Just have a look at the DNA and RNA. It's simple, but still exactly how it should be. Here's the link to the webpage where you can find background information and all the other formats of the series. And I was able to find at least a link uh, for some of them in English, and uh, I watched... Uh, one about tetanus vaccination, which was uh, pretty much uh, true. There were one or two things that, you know, were maybe uh, simplifications, but uh, it was charming. Anyway, she continues, I hope you'll enjoy it with or without your kids. Hmm. Greetings from lovely Berlin, Germany, <laughs> 11 a.m., 20 degrees, sunny with a few small clouds. <laughs> P.S. There's a new podcasting a podcast publishing platform rising in Berlin, which tries to help podcasters making podcasting as easy as possible. And she gives a link to that. They are still in beta phase, but keep an eye on them. It'll be worth it. Hmm, neat. I wonder why she says, after a long battle with myself, I finally decided to participate in your podcast. Maybe she thinks of herself as shy. But she's. But when you write that, you know, yes. it's not like talking. But anyway, thank you, Marin, for sending it. Those are great. Those are yes. really cool. Excellent. And our last one, Dixon, do you want to try reading one more? I'll give it one more try here. So Buck writes, hey, Twiv folks, my name's Buck Tri Tribble. I'm a first <laughs> Tribble, Buck Tribble. No, That's I'm right. laughing because Alan made it 18 point. All right. <laughs> 24 point. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Did you see the change, Dixon? No, I don't know. It doesn't show up on mine at all. Too bad. Oh, dear. I want something bigger, not smaller. Thank you, Alan. Well, um, I made it bigger. Oh, you did? Yes, uh, I am bigging it. Just a minute. Just a minute. It's got to be here. Reset. Hit the refresh. Hit the, hit the refresh okay, wait, button. Wait. Wait. Do you have internet? I don't know. <laughs> we're going to see here. We're going to just see. We're just scrolling. Yeah, oh, is. my goodness. All right. I could give a speech in front of 1,000 people. I could, have, you know, <laughs> President Well, you're Obama. giving it in front of 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> I'll begin again. Hey, Twivoke. <laughs> I have my new microphone now, too. So, my name is Buck Tribble. I'm a first year PhD student at Rockefeller University, where I'm doing lab rotations and currently working in the fascinating world of CRISPR. I just came across this remarkable paper and thought to send it along in case you'd like a nice evolutionary story. CRISPR immune system, as you've discussed on the show, is a sequence guided adaptive immunity that allows bacteria to protect themselves against phage. Here we have a phage picking up the CRISPR system and using it to attack portions of the bacterial genome that confer resistance to the phage. Just incredible. It's not wholly unlike the story of phages of cyanobacter 
bacteria picking up the genes required to keep photosynthesis active so they can maximize replication as they kill their host, which I believe was discussed on TWIM a while ago. Anyway, cheers. Here's the paper. You know, I, I, I think you should that, make all the email this big. That was good, way. Dixon. Well, uh, that's because I can finally read the damn thing. All right, thing. I'm sorry. I didn't realize you couldn't. Now, <laughs> from now on, we'll make everything, well, 24 point. We'll have 20 page. <laughs> it's easy. Well, you know. Well, we'll just, we'll just blow them up when it comes to you. Just blow yeah. them up. That's we right. actually discussed this. We had Andy Camilli, the PI on this paper, right, on TWIM so. number 56. Yeah. Uh, Buck, so check that out. Right. It's a really cool story. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And guess what? That's it for email. Dear, dear. But we do have twenty more waiting in the in the <laughs> oh. arm in the wings. Yes, oh, since uh, last week we've got many. But that's fine. We love it, right? Mm-hmm. You bet. Let's do some picks, and let's start with Alan today. Okay. Um, I have one that that comes from my my adolescent years, um, sort you mean of like today. Uh, yes, like today. Um, <laughs> this is. Um, I have two links here. One is to a music video um, by a a rapper. uh, Stage name is MC Frontalot, Um, and uh, then there's it's he did this video. It's uh, in connection with a movie uh, about a similar topic. If you if you used computers much or were obsessed with computers in the early '80s. you will get at least some of the references in the music video, uh, which is which is about text-based adventure games. Mm. I don't know if any of you played any of these. Yeah. What mm-hmm. was that famous one, the first one? Uh, adventure was the first adventure, one. Adventure, yeah. That was on mainframe computers, and yep. then um, uh, several different people ported the same concept to the first personal computers, especially the Apple II. Yeah. And uh, that's where I encountered them as a as a uh, an easily influenced um, 13 year old and and spent many many hours of my youth um, figuring out where the treasures were or how to disarm the nuclear power plant or what have you he's got quite a collection of old computers here in this basement yes nice and, uh, and he he refers to um, a, a huge number of different uh, adventure games which if you were into these you'll You'll get a lot of the references in the video. The movie that it's that it's promoting is a documentary about this beginning of the computer gaming industry and these cool. text-based adventure games and the enormous influence that they've had on on um, so much of the rest of the computing industry. Cool, that's great. MC Frontalot. MC Frontalot, who his other videos are also nice. a lot of fun, cool. and his music generally. Wait, thank you very much, Dixon. Do you have a pick? Well. If you we want to go back in history, I'm not sure that I picked these because, frankly, I mean, this is a long show for us here, you know? So I have four books that I recommended to my students at all times, and I think I've picked several of these, but the one that I haven't picked is the one I'm going to pick. <laughs> so whichever one is missing from that list, you can put that in there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, that's one way to approach this. Dixon, every time you do a pick, I... Poised, You're ready stunned. to Google something, and yeah. now no, no, well, don't don't just stand there. Do something. <laughs> you stumped me. I'm supposed to find all the books that Dixon has picked throughout history think, of Twitter. Think of the one. No, not all of them. Not all of them. Well, so gonna, but you can. I'm going to tell you which. Name the four. Okay. I can, of yeah. course, I can, of course. Okay. I can. So the first one I know I've already picked, and that is the Lorax by mm-hmm. Dr. Susan. Yeah, I, I, think I know I picked, picked that it, really? book. Second book I know I've picked is, I believe I picked um, San Canny Almanac, which was a recent pick. Yeah, yeah. recently yeah. I did that one. But up. then there was this book um, called The Man Who Planted Trees. I'm not sure I picked that one that ever. That doesn't sound familiar. Good, right? I'll pick that then. Because <laughs> I'm going to save the other one for the next time then. All right, let me just check because the list. You know, we do have a list. We do. Uh, that's right. They're easy and to I check. And I think no one looks at it because there's always mistakes well, on it. for sure I don't. Never <laughs> <sees anything. laughs> you go, I it's at called it. twiv.tv slash weekly dash picks. Right. So a search for man who planted, the man who planted trees. Trees. I'll yeah. just search for trees, moon trees. That's not it. It's it. We didn't pick it. No. By John Giono. It's a fabulous read. Kathy and I are the only ones who look at this page. Oh, really? Right, Kathy? So the reason why I picked this book for my students is because it's about a single person in the south of France starting his life out at mid-age for this story, and his job is to plant 100 trees a day. Mm-hmm. So I, I read this story a lot to kids, uh, like, say, sixth graders, and they loved when I came to talk to them because they got to stop work. 
well, the class that I usually interrupted was the math class. So I said, okay, uh, this is not an interruption of your math class. This is a mere continuation. So if a man is 42 years old when he starts planting 100 trees a day and he dies at the age of 83, how many trees does he plant? And so I said, you can use your calculators. You can just go out and do it. You know? And so they did, and it's in the millions. So, and I said, oh, you know, but <laughs> I forgot to tell you. you know, the, he only had 43.2% survival of the birches, only 5.3% survival of oaks. You know, I was just joking with them at that time. But, but what they're amazed at is how many things a single person can do if they put their mind to it. And that's what the point of this book is, and it's beautifully written. And it's, um, it's been made into a cartoon with um, uh, Paul Winter playing in the background and uh, narrated by um, Christopher Plummer. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful read, and I highly recommend it. It's, it's a really feel-good book. It's, it's an honest feel-good book. But it also says what the power of one is. Mm-hmm. Well, look, Dixon, we do a twiv a week, and look how many we've done. We do. That's yep. exactly right. You just keep doing it. The twiv of a million broadcasts starts <laughs> with the first word. <laughs> I like that voice. Well, it's my uh, FM voice. <laughs> Kathy, what do you have? I picked the world's smallest stop motion film and how it was made. And these are two uh, YouTube videos that uh, the first one came out in April. And so that's why I had to check the twi- twiv pics mm. because I felt like <laughs> oh, we true. must have looked at this before but um, it's by IBM and they move atoms around on this very short uh, yes. stop motion film and I hear it playing hey, now. It is. Somewhere. I'm playing it. I'm playing it. <laughs> well, it's anyway. background. Well, thank you. Oh, shut up. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> shut up. Shut up. And, I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> and then from that, and almost 5 million people have looked at it. So if you if wow. you haven't, you might want to do that. And then uh, another link to it at the end, or also I just copied and pasted that link here, is how it was made. And they interview the scientists and they tell about how the atoms are moved with this 12 atom uh, glob and they have a model of that and (laughs) at the end of it uh, one of the scientists says you know this was a lot of work but we thought it was really cool and if a thousand kids like it and are interested in (laughs) science instead of going to law school then I think it was worthwhile (laughs) so the the same idea of you know if an image helps to uh, attract people to science then then yeah. that's a good thing well they should have actually had it narrated by uh, robin williams who could have then said nano nano <laughs> <laughs> anyway check it out cool. it's, it's neat it's, yeah. very nice, very by nice. the way it's okay to be uh, attracted to science and go to law school <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, right I, you bet uh, my pick is open access fiasco oh yes Which everyone has probably heard about even dixon right yeah sure This is a writer for Science Magazine who submitted a bogus paper to many, many, over 300, I think, uh, open access journals. And it was all fabricated. Just as a test. The names of the participants, the institution. Uh, Okafaru Kobanje, biologist at the Wasi Institute of Medicine in Asmara. And um, (laughs) it was accepted by a few journals. Sure. And... um, it's basically an article. It's a sting, right? Trying to uncover all this yeah. unsavory open access. These are just journals who set up shop somewhere and charge you money, and that's the way they make money. They don't care what what they're publishing. Nope. Pretty sad, but what is good is that uh, the PLOS Journal rejected it very mm. quickly and did a thorough review. So we're happy about that. How about that. Well, this is just unbelievable. <laughs> um. It? However. Yes. There's been a lot of discussion, subsequent discussion of this paper um, Where? among Where? Uh, you, you uh, on you Twitter. You have accepted it yeah. uh, <laughs> on, on Twitter and, uh, and among uh, science writers and scientists, yes. uh, and certainly among open access advocates. Um, there's, if you look at this as an experiment, mm-hmm. there's a whole arm missing. Um, the, he didn't send the the bogus paper to any. Pub, any um, publications that were not open access. True. And so the angle on this is this is pretty much a hit. Okay, it's it's of course there's bad stuff in the open access world. 
how does it compare to the bad stuff that we know exists in the <laughs> closed access world? Yeah. Now, of course, science as a closed access um, membership organization publication has a dog in this fight. Of course. And in the interest of full disclosure, I, I should point out, I, I do a lot of work for science. In fact, I'm working on an article now that is <laughs> going to be for them. And uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to say that they deliberately are trying to uh, uh, stack the deck, but that I, I do feel that this was a very poorly conducted study um, and that it should have been more rigorous, particularly since it was being done by a subscription journal. Actually, he mentions this at the end of the article. He said, yeah. if I had targeted someone <coughs> just conferred with a small group of scientists who care deeply about open access, and they say that the open access model is not to blame, if I had targeted traditional subscription-based journals, uh, this one fellow said, I strongly suspect you would get the same results. So, yeah. yes, uh, that's acknowledged here. It would and, be interesting to do that experiment, but now, of course, you can't do it. And let's remember that one of the <laughs> biggest closed-access scientific publishers in the world, a company called Elsevier, mm -hmm. published six entirely fake journals a few years ago. Yeah. I mean, they created <laughs> journals for marketing for pharmaceutical companies. So it's not as if one or the other uh, side of this debate has the moral high ground. I, I totally agree with that. I was at a New York Academy meeting a while ago when we had someone from Nature, and she outrightly made fun of open access journals, saying, you know, it's just a website somewhere, when in fact we all know that there are some very good ones out there. Yes. So I don't think it's fair to... I, I have a feeling this has a bad effect on open access, and, and it, it's not entirely deserved, right? Right. I mean, it is, it is certainly a valid point... Um, and really one that everybody kind of already knew, that there are these predatory publishers, yeah. and there are some very, very shady operations, and it is the nature of the open access publishing model that those can exist. Right. When you said that before, somehow I got a list of them, and they're sticking up here on my computer. Avins, the Omics Group, and one called Dove Press, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, bogus hmm. publications. Hmm. But no connection, no connection. No, now. just coincidental. I would be a far wealthier person than I am, if I, I'm sure, if I, if I did predatory <laughs> open access. Um, but yeah, because the publication model there is based on the authors paying page charges. Yeah. Sure. Uh, it's the the barrier to entry is very very low. You don't have to get a list of subscribers and actually get people to pay for the journal, because people are going to come to you with money and pay you to publish their papers. Uh, whereas there's a little higher barrier to entry if you're going to start a subscription journal. So only the big established companies like Elsevier can pull off the big scams. Uh, so clearly, the a big culprit here is page charges. Yes, and I have always found that to be an easy model for paying for open access, but not the only one. But it's very easy to use and, exp and, and pay for your, for your costs, right? But there are yeah. other models that are just harder to implement. And I feel that the open access journals have just taken the easy way out. And I wish they would explore other models, and that would, that would get at this problem. What models are you, are you talking about? Well, I'm, I'm going to sell them, so I'm not going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I think you could do a wonderful advertising sales-based model where every component in every paper was hyperlinked to the vendor, and you got a fraction of the sales. I would love to have a shopping cart for a certain technique. Here, I want to do this, and I click this, and I get everything I need. It takes huh. a lot of work, huh. but I bet... No one's explored that, and, and it's oh, a work. Oh, I wouldn't say nobody's explored <clears throat> that. Not to I the work. extent that I'm talking about. Not to the extent. It hasn't been implemented as smoothly as it could be implemented, but I'm not sure that that's the main barrier to to being able to support a whole journal on it. I, I have worked for a number of closed circulation, um, or what they're called in the trade, uh, closed circulation um, magazines, uh, which are, some people refer to this as throwaways. Um, these are the things, uh, biotechniques, um, nature methods, um, uh, bioscience, technology, drug discovery and development. They, they show up in your lab and you don't know that you subscribe to them, but you, you're the target audience and their advertisers support it. Yeah. So that's a, that's a legitimate uh, and well-established business model from the printed days and it's now migrating online and people are experimenting with these sorts of things um, right. and that's that, that could work. So that's right. one thing. Another thing yeah. 
you have to subscribe to a journal. How much does it cost? Not, nature is what ninety nine bucks a year, right? Why don't you make it nineteen ninety five? You'll you'll triple your subscribers because people who want to read the articles will subscribe. It's like you subscribe to your newspaper or a magazine. People don't think twice about putting down nineteen bucks for Vogue, but make it cheaper. You could get a lot more subscription. And finally, cut out the front matter. You have so much staff that you have to pay to make the front matter stuff. I want to see the research articles. And, you know, plus journals have 120 staff people that they have to pay, many of whom deal with this front matter stuff. I don't think you need to have that. Thanks for putting me out of work. Oh, you'll get plenty of work. You work for the trade publications. <laughs> yeah, I, I do work for, for other public. I mean, I, I do a variety of, of types of assignments that are not going to go away, even if it's all open access with no front matter. But I just think it's crazy. Listen, you, you, you do research. You publish something that's going to advance science for everyone, and I have to pay $2,000 to publish it? This makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, Zero. And, and a large part of that is because the subscription rates are based on the huge, huge investment that a lot of these companies have in the print model. Mm. Right. Yeah, and you yeah. can't just snap your fingers and make the printed issues of science and nature and all these others disappear and say, now it's all online. Right. Um, so how did we get from here to there? And they, it's a very open question whether people will pay nineteen ninety nine a year for an online subscription. I bet a lot of more people will than than are paying ninety nine bucks, right? I mean, you, now you go to an article, you got to pay thirty five dollars. A lot of people have placed bets on yeah, that. That's loss, ridiculous, though. by the way. That's... Yeah, but they didn't do it right. Okay, <laughs> I think paying forty dollars for a research article is crazy. I just that think is... that you know, there's the the open access movement is partly driven by people who want to read the science, and I just yes. think that they would just subscribe to certain um, journals if you I'm made totally it cheaper. I'm totally in favor of that, and I I just. Being being inside the industry and having come from the science, I I see both sides of this. I mean, I don't see Elsevier's side in publishing fake journals, but I, I do see I do see the difficulties of getting from where we are, which is I think everybody should agree not satisfactory to where we want to be. Right. Um, All right. I'm sorry to have diverted. Anyway, no, that's that's a fine topic. We so, could we could do a whole show on it, right? We could do a whole show on it. Yes. So one thing um, is that this particular pick of Vincent's is in uh, a section of the science that, because I'm a dinosaur, I just got the hard copy of. <laughs> the title of, on the cover is "Communication in Science: Pressures and Predators," and so there's a whole series of articles. The one thing that I haven't been able to find online is the equivalent of this two-page giant cartoon about the publication um, mm. that's, again, looks like it's by the PhD comics or that those, that kind of style, um, something that we've picked in the past. Um, oh, and that, so that, people who have the hard copy might want to huh. take a look at that. But there's articles about um, the seer of science publishing, the power of negative thinking, cloak and dagger publishing, lock up the genome, lockdown research, Sounds like something we may have covered in the past. Mm -hmm. um, things like that. So, uh, hmm. w worth a look. If you and by the way, most science news articles, um, you need to be a subscriber to be able to read. Uh, but the uh, Who's Afraid of Peer Review um, sting against uh, open access is open access. Mm. Nice. <laughs> that's, that's really meta. Yes. <laughs> All right. That's TWIV254. And it will be found at twiv.tv and also on iTunes and as I always say if you like what we do just go over to iTunes and give us some stars or a short rating and that, that procedure helps to keep us very visible over there in the very crowded Apple podcast directory do send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv Dixon de Pommier can be found at verticalfarm.com and also at trichinella.org and medicalecology.com. Good to see you, Dixon. Thank Same. you. Well, my pleasure. <clears throat> you know that. You know, we do pick on you, but... You do. We it's okay. We are only doing it in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of defense back from the listener group, so I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that great? They defend yeah. you. I, 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 I'm, you know, I go home and dream about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. And Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com and also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. And don't forget, those of you in Austin, Texas, come out and see us next week, Wednesday, <laughs> October 16th, 4 p.m. in MBB 1.210. And we'll do a TWIV. What is it, the Longhorns? Yeah, Texas Longhorns. Longhorns go viral. There it is. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twib is viral.